Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, a podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy body, mind, and spirit. I'm Reed Robison, psychiatrist and chief clinical officer at Numinous. My co-host, Dr. Steve Thayer, wasn't here this week because he was off at a MAPS MDMA therapist training somewhere in the wilderness in Colorado. So I took this golden opportunity to bring back one of our frequent and favorite guests, Hannah Cross, licensed clinical social worker and lead psychedelic facilitator and trainer on our psychedelic studies and ketamine therapy work. Hannah also happens to be my significant other, AKA my better half. Since she's my life partner as well as podcast partner for co-creating this particular episode, We couldn't show up in any other way but as our authentic selves. So, in this episode, we talk about embodiment, we get a little vulnerable, we share some stories about our personal and shared journeys of embodiment, including how we use the body and somatic practices on the path to healing and growth, both personally and in our work and communities. So, without further ado, I present to you my conversation with Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Hey. How you doing? Good. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. This is fun. Mm-hmm. We're sitting here in our apothecary mm-hmm. slash dining room recording a podcast. Yep. Yeah, and it's um, when you're on this podcast, uh, it's always a smash hit. So I'm... Uh, I'm looking forward to it, especially because we get to chat about the body. Mm -hmm. Chat about the body, chat with each other is something we we have plenty of experience with. Yeah, we in fact love to do. It'd be easy today. Yeah. So why don't we start with... hmm. I have an idea. Go for it. Why don't we start this episode talking about our kundalini class that we went to on Wednesday just for fun? Oh, yeah. That was a good one. Mm Mm-hmm. Talk about body practices that facilitate healing that sometimes is hard to even wrap your mind around, right? Oh, yeah. And for a little background, so this is just a slight tangent, but when I went out to the jungle to help with an ayahuasca retreat, there was it was a, it was a retreat that Gabor Mate had set up, and he has his style of compassionate in- inquiry. He's a genius in his own right, and there was a kundalini teacher from Canada of a famous one out there who came out, experienced the retreat. It was, it was a couple of years before I was there. Um, and she said, because ayahuasca isn't available in Canada, I'm going to pair Gabra Mate's approach with Kundalini yoga, oh, AKA yeah. the most powerful psychedelic yoga you can probably mm. reach for around here. Um, is that actually what she called it? Psychedelic yoga? No, okay. I, I, uh, I call Kundalini psychedelic yoga, okay. but, uh, Sounded more like you. she sticks to the, the proper terminology and she, uh, has done some wonderful things using that pairing like Kundalini plus mm-hmm. compassionate inquiry for addiction and other things. Pretty cool. Oh, that's yeah. pretty neat. So Kundalini, AKA psychedelic yoga, you want to walk mm-hmm. through what our fun class was like? Yeah. So we go to this class and the parts I remember are the very first exercise we did was snoring for two minutes. So laying on the back and creating a snoring sound for two minutes. Um, we did pretty well. I mean, I think I released a lot of energy through laughter on that one. Mm-hmm. I was I was crying, <laughs> tears streaming down my face. So the teacher was good about uh, laughter's good. It's a mm-hmm. movement of energy. Let mm-hmm. it all out and keep snoring. One minute to go. Mm-hmm. And we proceeded to do a number of kind of funky exercises, including hanging like a gingerbread with our arms down to the floor Mm -hmm. and then there was this gong with overlapping kind of um bangs of the gong oh yeah that must have gone on for what it felt like 20 minutes yeah and you and i both shared afterwards that we both had these interesting somatic um or like body sensations happening during that gonging experience that we couldn't necessarily make sense of but that were really really notable Mm -hmm. shifting of energy in the body almost feeling like parts of the body were 
like dismembered, but in this kind of <laughs> curious, not necessarily scary way. Pleasantly dismembered. Pleasantly dismembered. Yeah, yeah I, I literally thought um, it was your hand on my arm for a minute when I looked over, but it was just a body trip mm -hmm. through this psychedelic yoga experience. And then, of course, there's like a thunderstorm during class and fireworks and from fireworks Corn right Belly's outside. Corn Maze. <laughs> That's right outside the window. We were mm -hmm. at uh, a place here in Utah called Brick Canvas mm -hmm. um, in Lehigh. So quite the sensory experience, mm -hmm. um, kind of maybe to the ego weird, but uh, facilitated some shifts of energy in the body. And I think that's um, part of the mystery around maybe a lot of the things that we'll talk about today is that mm -hmm. um, there are practices that put you in the body and create shifts in the mind. And so therefore mm -hmm. the body can be used as this way to heal or to move things along. I love, I love this segue that you, or this uh, little story time that you've thrown in the mix because it reminds me of, of how Kundalini yoga or yoga in general, or even things like breath work are gateways to uh, the inner world, mm -hmm. like gateways to everything in and through the body. Um, I think I may have told you before, even before this class, uh, uh, a story of when I was in one of these Kundalini classes and the teacher was like, okay, now we're going to do this Kriya. Those exercises are called Kriyas and we're going to do it uh, for 27 minutes. Just this motion of breathing and like splashing your face with water. I just hit the microphone. <laughs> and, and at first I was like, are you kidding? This is a joke. And then so I start doing it and I notice the restlessness. I li literally got up. It's a little embarrassing to admit because I try not to do this in yoga. I got up and went to the bathroom and then I'm like, okay, I'm plugging in. I get back on my mat and I do it. I think we're at like 22 minutes in and boom, poof. I transcended the human realm. This is psychedelic yoga, not psychedelic medicines you ingest. And it was just this transpersonal experience mm -hmm. from there. And it was such a reminder that we, we can use the body as a vehicle to, to attain, enter those altered states, those higher states, those uh, other realms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and breath. Yeah. That, that you just described reminded me of holotropic breath work, which my experience with holotropic breath work has been that it is one of the most somatically activating um, practices I've ever oh, yeah. I've ever experienced, and like very surprisingly quickly, quickly so. Like you're doing this kind of deep rhythmic breathing, and next thing you know, I mean, in some situations, like the entire body is mm -hmm. lit up with sensation, and sometimes it's pleasant. But a lot of times it's oh, not. Yeah. It's really difficult. I did one night of holotropic breath work, six hour ceremony, three hours straight of, of breath work. There were probably at least 30 people in the room and almost everyone afterwards mm -hmm. just shared that they experienced this really intense pain in the body. And a lot of people had this kind of shared experience of either giving, ha giving birth, the sensation of giving birth mm -hmm. or being born. And wow. yeah, it certainly felt like being crushed in my own body, but, um, it's a, it's a beautiful practice. Cause even through that, that difficult experience, there's a facilitator there to help you move that energy through your body. And she will, you know, you could raise your hand and mm -hmm. this really experienced facilitator trained by Stan Groff would come over and facilitate a little bit of focused body work to mm -hmm. help you move that energy through. And there's a huge lesson in that, like with the intense kind of sensations that are rising, you can learn how to shift that energy um, by typically honoring the body. Yeah, um, yeah. So that it, it moves through and you find this release or similar to your Kundalini experience, this transcendence. Yeah. Um, I remember this one time in holotropic breath work, just getting tetany, which is not uncommon in holotropic Lobster breath work. claws. Yeah. And mine were not stuck outwards. Like a lot of people's are, mine were stuck in these fists oh, yeah, and it was yeah. so incredibly painful at first. But mm. I remember kind of putting my hands out like this and saying, 
what do you need from me right now to my hands? And Mm. all of a sudden, the energy kind of shot forward into my fingertips where it became pleasant. It was still an equal Mm. amount of energy, but I could direct it and play with it. So I was kind of playing with this, this light energy as well as moving it through my body. And it was a really beautiful experience. I love that. I love breath work, especially holotropic or those long ones or those really supported ceremonies as a way to use the body to access that state because you're the one who has to keep on breathing. And um, it's just there's something rewarding about it of uh, like going deep without needing to take a medicine and medicines are great, but then you're along for this, this ride, but you're really honoring and using the breath as a gateway to your unconscious or your subconscious realms and it's just it's beautiful Mm -hmm. yeah i guess that is kind of the overall topic of our podcast today right how do we use the body to gain access to the unconscious mind um or to heal yeah the body for healing and growth and to live a full Um, meaningful life with deep connections and presence uh, because really uh, all of that good stuff is only found in the here and now and when we're embodied Mm -hmm. right so maybe we talk about your our journeys home to the body yeah do you want to start or Um, I was gonna ask you to start (laughs) Uh, happy to (laughs) so I remember I don't know the first story that comes to mind of course as kids we're we're embodied by nature and society tends to uh do a number on that um in a in a lot of different ways and i'll maybe table that for later in our discussion but um i think it was when i was in medical school so i'm i'm uh an adult and you know somewhat in touch with my body, but not really using it um, in kind of a meditation or embodiment practice. And I just liked being physically active. But I remember one moment when I started exploring meditation, a certain form of Buddhist meditation that uses the body for presence, the breath and the senses. And I was uh, listening to these tapes that I got from the library. This is when I had a cassette tape in my vehicle. (laughs) So I'm dating things a little bit. And uh, it's telling, it's not meant to be done while you're driving, but I was was feeling safe. And, And it says, okay, you're coming to the breath, you're coming to the senses, like your hand on whatever it is on. Mine was on the steering wheel, back on the chair, on the seat, listen to the hum of the room. And there was something about that moment of just like, wow, coming home to the body and using the breath to go inside, even while keeping my eyes closed, it just changed my experience. Like all of a sudden I could feel everything. I could Mm. see everything. I was this human in a body, but also um, feeling things deeply and sensing everything around me. And it just opened up this, this curious, passionate path to explore, like what the heck was that? (laughs) Um, but then to fast forward a little, I started, I dove deep on meditation and, um, even started eventually teaching it, but I found it so hard to get people to just sit in meditation. Like it's either boring or the monkey mind is too loud. I can't do it. Or they're just squirming because their bodies are not limber or able to sit still um and so that's when i stumbled upon yoga and that just cracked open a an, my real embodiment journey is uh um, just peeling away layer upon layer and reconnecting parts that were just lost or i tuned out of um and started teaching that like you have taught yoga as well as as one of the tools you use um so maybe I'll uh, pause there. Is that's when it that's when it really uh, came to life for me, and then I brought it into the workplace too, especially working with eating disorders, coming home to your body, uh, examining your relationship with food and body, and and all of that as a as a kind of a mirror of your relationship with God mm. and all life. Mm-hmm. 
Wow, I could take what you just said and like I want to ask you all these questions and turn it into a whole episode. But one of the ones that stands out, I think, is how do you think that yoga facilitates that really coming home to the body? Yeah, so for for me, when I roll out my yoga mat and uh, I'm talking about like in the traditional practice I've done the most, say like, of my sore practice in Ashtanga, where, you know, it's a it's a morning thing, you're supported by an instructor, but you're working through a sequence on your own. It's not the most common yoga you'll find out there, but one that really spoke to me for this important chapter. And when I roll out my yoga mat, stand on there and just turn my awareness inward, I get all of a sudden so much information. Mm-hmm. I just know is my breath uh, deep and smooth? Is it shallow and choppy, uh, which it often is, and I didn't even know it. And then um, tuning into it starts to have it let it settle. But it's just so much information that comes out of there. And then um, just as I scan the body and start to engage different parts of it, I'm literally coming home to like a fuller experience of being alive, mm-hmm. like mm. like re-inhabiting the body is like where I've just found the most meaningful like connection and joy and experience. And this practicing on the yoga mat lets me do it, like recalibrate there, but also learn to do it outside, outside when, when we all get disembodied by the stress and everyday life or when we check out, numb out, um, get distracted. Or even we, when we start like texting someone in another place we're essentially you know and and that's important at times but we're essentially you know taking some of our awareness out of the here and now Mm -hmm. um and it it makes sense like if i were texting someone right now while we're having this conversation i'm only half present and half half embodied and really half feeling the moment you Mm -hmm. know yeah i i am uh relating as I'm listening to you, like the experience of being in a yoga class to a psychedelic experience where psychedelics we know can be this kind of magnifying glass of what's going on in the mind. And the the yoga practice is the same, right? So you're bringing your attention inward and there's so much information there. Like you said, Um, recently we went to that hot vinyasa class and I remember the teacher kind of having us, he commanded us to sit there with our sweat on our mats and then he kind of began mm-hmm. these these like um questions out of curiosity like are you performing in here if so you're probably doing it on outside yeah. of here um are you restless in here if so like how are you running away from the present moment outside of here and it really can be such a mirror to the way our mind is you know out, outside of the the yoga room yeah. um i was thinking about this other thing i think i want to add to that around like the way that yoga helps facilitate this healing um especially as lately i've been doing this like integrated hatha class gauche lineage it's hard and it's long and it's really (laughs) hot and that's not always the kind of yoga that's called for but one of the things that seems to be the lesson in that kind of yoga like being stuck on your mat in what sometimes feels like a torture chamber with nowhere to run nowhere to hide is Mm -hmm. actually you learn to trust your body more because there are these moments where your mind says i can't go any further but you know you have a, a teacher and you have this commitment to your practice and you continue to go further and then you realize, yeah. oh, I'm fine. Like my body has me. Thank you, body. Like I can trust mm-hmm. you way more than I thought I could yeah. or way more than my ego is telling me that I could. Like we're here. We made it through that class and we feel so much more alive for it. So that building yeah. of, tr- of trust in the body to really kind of carry you through difficult experiences the way you describe it makes me realize that it really was like a psychedelic experience that that class or the class we're about to go to after we finish this little conversation that 90 minute hot room how many poses like 90 there's uh, like 84, 84 in the poses, one that they're doing yeah including um yeah including arm balances and back bends and drop backs and standing up and all that but it's this like the sitting with the discomfort on a yoga mat in a practice setting 
has done more mm -hmm. for me in day-to-day -day life in terms of like um, nervous system, emotion regulation, and ability to ride the waves of everyday life yep. more than anything else I can more Imagine. than anything else. <laughs> yeah. And we've been talking about this a little bit recently, just um, this shared gratitude that we have for the mm -hmm. way that yoga has prepared us for life yeah. and has also helped teach us the art of surrender mm -hmm. and being able to just let go and trust. Um, so yeah. yeah, so much, so much thank you. An infinite number of thank yous to the, oh, yeah. <laughs> to the yoga path infinite thank you mm -hmm. um one other yoga thought and then i want to hear more of your your journey is that uh in the lineage i was talking about ashtanga where it's a system of practice not a not a religion but a, a one that works with all spiritual walks of life where you're starting with the the poses and the then the breath and then your awareness and concentration moving towards this like more state of like blissful unbounded awareness but but when it has a sequence that you repeat mm -hmm. like the ghost lineage does mm -hmm. uh you start to get out of your head mm -hmm. and into your senses where the magic is mm -hmm. and so like when you're doing when you're just breathing and you don't have to think about what's coming next you can just surrender and trust the process the flow of the body and then that's when that transcendence happens or that expansion of your awareness where you're you're still in a body and you still have awareness of that, but you're so much more, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a hard thing to describe. But. I think that that really needs to be repeated though. What you said, that phrase around getting out of the head and into your senses. And that's where the magic happens because that mm. really is the case. And despite the fact that I've had these body practices for years and have, you know, walked through trauma therapy to heal the way that trauma has been stored in the body, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. I still have to, on a daily basis, consciously come back into the census. Um, yeah. And that is like the way to get insight, get clarity, um, move from fear to love, move from judgment to compassion. Yep. It really is about taking a pause sitting my butt down or hitting the yoga mat and coming back into the body. And really the magic happens there when you are mm -hmm. fully present with your senses, there is this and Hakomi method, Hakomi therapy is like based on this, right? There really is this kind of magic that happens, mm -hmm. this natural unfolding that opens up this wisdom that kind of bubbles up from, from the unconscious and can guide us. So like the word magic, I don't think is an overstatement at all from what happens when we get out of the head and move into the senses yeah there it, there is something magic about it like the inner healing intelligence that we talk about in psychedelic therapy so much is found within the body i mean when everyone talks about it it's in you so is everything so mm -hmm. are all the answers if we can just quiet the mind come home to the senses open the heart and then the soul can speak mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yep so uh you want to tell some more journey home to the body My stories. personal journey yeah. home to the body. Yeah. Um, so when I was thinking about it and reflecting on kind of where I was before I decided to take that journey, there's mm -hmm. this interesting like polarity between dissociation. Like when I was teenager, young adult dissociation, and also this just really intense hunger to feel something that I think mm -hmm. came from that. And so I was yeah. both dissociating in a very, in a variety of ways and engaging in these like risky, harmful behaviors that I think came from this real hunger to feel. And yeah. I can like look back on um, you know, younger Hannah and feel all the compassion in the world because I just did not know how to really connect with my body in a way that was going to work at all. Like I just had no idea how yeah. I would begin even doing that. Um, so anyway, I, th the, um, return back to the body for me started with, um, meditation, yes, but I'll admit my meditation, even looking back on those earlier meditations that I chose to do were not fully mm -hmm. embodied, like a little more, um, I want to get out of my body and, um, I don't know, experience a mm -hmm. blissful state kind of thing. Um, so a little bit of meditation, but physique competition. So I did these NGA MPC competitions 
And though that was, I think, needed because Mm -hmm. I needed to get into a place of like discipline with my body, which doesn't apply to to everybody. I mean, some people yeah. fall maybe more on this the side of over discipline, over control with the body. But I, coming out of my teenage years, was on the exact opposite of that, like um, impulsivity and recklessness, no discipline in regards to the way that I treated my body. Mm-hmm. So I did these really structured um, like protocols in order to prepare for competition. But the other thing that came out of that that was really helpful was just attention to my body I started bringing my attention back to the body where it really hadn't like been there and that was a good first step but I think it was a a bit of a pendulum swing from like the undisciplined life to like discipline and since then I've kind of um practiced finding more of like a middle path between the two um had some friends that family friends that came and saw me compete and they said hannah we think you would love this bikram yoga thing they took me to my first hot yoga class and i got addicted after a few times Mm. um because of that what we were just talking about like the thing that it did for me when i was on my mat for 90 minutes having to breathe through discomfort um again nowhere to run nowhere to hide how do i stay with myself for the duration of this and so that was that was how i got into yoga it's amazing yeah and you probably learn a lot of of uh not just um tuning into the body through that physique and competition and discipline phase but like a lot of confidence too of just knowing that you can you can harness a lot of infinite possibility by engaging the body like the body mm-hmm. the body is our like our sacred partner through life. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, that's an analogy I quite like because with you and I being in partnership, the the sacred... (laughs) We may need to cut this, but... uh, Or not. The sacred... You're embodied. uh, The sacred partner analogy is pretty neat. Like if you view your body as a sacred partner you're going to be gentle. Like mm-hmm. ideally we, all the couples work applies like listening, um, seeking first to understand before you like jump to, uh, reacting, opposing judgment, yelling at the body mm-hmm. doesn't work in yoga. Like your story with learning the discipline approach, but then learning the embodied approach with both discipline and compassion and tuning in and, uh, and pushing oneself while connected and tuned in is pretty amazing. Yeah. And we're not going to cut that part because (laughs) you were talking about embodiment. Like the reason why your heart is so open, because this is the definition of embodiment, right? Like a visual, tangible representation of what is like a congruency with something else. Like you're one of the most embodied men that I've ever met, if not the most. And that's (laughs) why... And so your heart shows up so openly, but, um, but yeah, yeah, you're exactly right about that. The kind of confidence that is gained from that initiating teamwork with the body, um, confidence that, oh yeah, like together, me and my body, we can do whatever is needed. Um, and then that building of the relationship with the body, like just being able to approach the body with curiosity curiosity, ask it questions. I was working with a Tantra coach for a little while. And that was one of the very first things that she had me do is start talking to my yoni, the sacred, Mm -hmm. um, reproductive and energetic um, seat of our feminine power. Um, Start talking to it, just asking it questions. Like, what is it that you need from me? What is it that you like and don't like what is it that you could use for me even in just my lifestyle and my everyday life to feel like you know we were in good relationship like you did with your hands and breath work exactly and like hakomi invites us to do we did that hakomi training this summer right where uh some of the practices invite like looking inward scanning the body and seeing where something is alive and even giving it a voice mm-hmm. asking it uh you know if if what is is there a truth to express or what do you have to tell us yeah yeah on that note just a recently it was um in that kundalini class afterwards i shared that i was trying to ask my body what was happening because i had yeah. some discomfort come up 
and it it didn't have a voice you know it was funny it was like i i'm i, I don't have a voice i don't have anything to tell you and the, kind of the message that i got was this is just stuff that needs to be released yeah um which a lot of times kind of happens after periods of expansion um i i think that's probably worth noting mm -hmm. because i see this a lot in psychedelic integration work where um, someone will have like a profound experience um, of expansion of some yeah, kind. Yeah. And um, then it's almost like the body needs to catch up. So that a lot of times it feels like right after periods of expansion, there's a period of contraction in the body because um, our pains are stored in the body. Mm -hmm. And I like Eckhart Tolle's concept of, of the pain body. Like there really is this pain body that kind of stores the the pains of the past mm -hmm. and sometimes the catching up process for that pain body to new awarenesses um is not comfortable it feels like growing a pains. release yes yeah. growing pains are like a purge of some kind and mm -hmm. that's that's physical you know uh i sometimes think about a pressure cooker analogy for the body and you know, all the steam and everything else in there is um, the energy moving through us. We're energetic beings. And if we don't have conscious, sometimes frequent ways of releasing some of that energy, like blowing mm -hmm. off steam is a term for a reason, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, if you don't do that consciously, purposefully in your practices, mm -hmm. it's going to blow. <laughs> yes. and, uh, or it'll spill out in other weird ways, like strange psychosomatic symptoms, illnesses, mm -hmm. pains. Um, and we all have different predispositions of the way we, the way we handle and, and spill out stress mm -hmm. in the, and, uh, I think your example of post psychedelic journeys, that expansion that occurs and coming home to the body. Yeah. It can be a bumpy landing sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you know, there was a, a recent, you know, psychedelic ceremony that I traveled to. And uh, uh, in that experience, I had this really distinct sense that I am not just my body. Mm. Like I could feel the energy around, like it, that the skin wasn't the limitation of mm -hmm. me or my awareness or my, you know, my presence and love and energy and, and that I could really expand that beyond um the body itself it mm -hmm. was it was wild but but when you get back into day-to-day -day life uh yeah, how to integrate that is sometimes yeah. a challenge yeah sometimes yeah. a challenge yeah i'd like to comment on that too because that's been a important lesson for me too especially in engaging in some of the like tantric kundalini energy related oh, yeah. practices like there really can be this intense sensation of now this energy that's probably been laying dormant in the body and it can be really overwhelming and yeah. has been. And not that long ago, I felt had an experience where I felt really overwhelmed with this energy that was kind of a, awakened and was showing up really intensely in my arms and mm -hmm. my head. And I um, was so overwhelmed that I couldn't really figure out how to, to make it kind of yeah. move through. I had this really similar, um, similar experience where that same kind of, I don't know what we want to call it, Shakti Kundalini awakened energy that once mm -hmm. overwhelmed me and the body was there. And I had this moment where I kind of went, oh, oh no, like here it is again. Shoot, yeah. we have to feel this. And then almost immediately there was this, wait a second, like this energy, it's not contained to the boundaries of my body. It really, like my body is so much more than just this normal like shape that I think that it is. Mm -hmm. And if I have awareness that that's the case, I can hold this energy. Like I'm yeah. big enough to hold whatever shows up emotionally, energetically. And then it was just very pleasant. It was not no longer overwhelming mm -hmm. once I had that awareness that the body is way more than I think that it is. Yeah, you let go of the the useless suffering around, like there might be discomfort, but if we're not in a state of surrender or acceptance and we fight it, you know, that suffering around it's gonna blow up or that resistance can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. But um, 
But those experiences are amazing to realize what you can hold. What like, you can hold. That's been a big lesson for me this year is uh, drawing from uh, like a question in some Ram Dass lectures that I really like is, can you keep your heart open in hell? You know, it ties into that smile of unbearable compassion mantra that we like and that you wear on a shirt sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, something I've been working on is how do I keep my heart wide open and remain in this body through all of it, through the discomfort, like we do on a yoga mat. And how do I do that when, when sad, when triggered, when ecstatic, mm -hmm. when, uh, when bored, when uh, distracted, um, you know, especially things like when angry or grieving, like how do you stay there um, and those practices to move energy through the body are so mm. important. I think starting with the breath, especially. Yeah, that, and you say that's been one of the big lessons of this year. I'm, I'm wondering if that's one of the like ultimate, most quintessential aims of healing work is mm -hmm. to be able to hold more and more and more feeling, to be able to yeah. feel more and more and more deeply and like know that you're, capable of doing that like that really is i think the way that it's like the greatest strength that we can work on cultivating is the ability to hold more and more feeling yeah because feeling is how we experience life like emotions give texture to our lives but and it's not just the emotions we're talking about like our body is how we how we navigate through life, how we experience life, we reconnect with that, we rediscover the universe, <laughs> the world. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you use this stuff in therapy? Mm. I mean, I always use this stuff in therapy. Mm -hmm. If the somatic piece is missing from therapy, then you have Good You're, luck. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. I like You against that. the mind. Yeah. 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 Um, Speaking of that, I had one client not that long ago and um, very intelligent, like mm -hmm. uh, pretty high functioning. Um, in our in our therapy sessions, it was like there was never any feeling happening beneath the brain. And so he could walk through these internal family systems type processes where he was seeing images of his parts and but there was no feeling attached to it. And it he understandably like was not really making much progress mm -hmm. um, in terms of his goal of wanting to connect more intimately to others, you know, and that's yeah. the goal. It's, it's apparent that we have to learn how to feel. Um, yep. So the um, ketamine is really helpful in that situation. We did some psycholytic mm. dose ses sessions with ketamine. So like a lower dose with a lozenge and took some time before moving into the reprocessing of the childhood trauma to really connect with the body. And it was like the first time I think he had ever felt some of those feelings that needed to be felt in order to be processed. Wow. And on the other side of that for this particular client was a spiritual experience. Like he hmm. felt the love of God. And so that's just like one ex for him and um, I'll also kind of contain this by saying part of his trauma was religious in nature. Like he felt very unloved oh, by oh. God. And um, so just one really neat example of how when you f can land in the body and really feel your feelings there, like that can be a pathway to one healing, but to this like real spiritual kind of experience. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of a, of a book a James Joyce book called The Dubliners, uh, where there's Mr. Duffy, he's a salesman and represents like every postmodern human who gets um, caught up in structure rules, uh, technology, distractions, disconnected from the body. And there's even a line in the book that says, Mr. Duffy lived at a great distance from his body. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that's always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've kind of used it as as fuel for the crusade of this coming home to myself. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a beautiful example, um, and how 
the body is when you do find it it's your greatest resource to mm -hmm. not only the way you connect with others um, not only the way you feel things in life but your greatest resource for weathering the storm of uh like day-to-day -day life and uh the way you access spirituality and mm -hmm. the you know enlightenment it's your vehicle to enlightenment yeah mm -hmm. a lot of times in therapy i think um the use of the body is just around like once again um sounding like a broken record around this but asking the body what it needs and so um, if I'm doing some, like, let's just say EMDR with a, a client, a trauma therapy, um, and they come to a place where they feel stuck. This applies to MDMA assisted sessions too, for sure. Um, there's like this stuckness in the processing, like, okay, nothing's changing. I'm looping on this anxiety in my chest, or I'm looping in this, like I feeling like I want to get out of here, or this distractibility. Mm -hmm. We might just take a moment to tune into the body and ask it what it needs and then follow it. I'm thinking of one example that is probably a good one for folks to hear because it shows that sometimes what the body tells you that it needs, like may not seem reasonable at the time. I had this one lady and she said, I just feel like I need to spit. I feel mm -hmm. like I need to spit. And so she, she started spitting in the trash can as I'm holding it out for yeah. her. And um, then she was like, this is anger. I'm spitting this anger out. And so when she was done spitting on the other side of that anger was this deep grief that she had been un unable to wow. process for years. And she was able to do that in the therapy session finally after moving that hmm. defense of anger through by spitting. Um, wow. So yeah. That's a, it's a powerful example because it's another consequence or embodiment casualty of day-to-day -day life is uh, how we get not only disconnected from emotions, but also we get the wires crossed when we're told as a kid growing up, or like boys don't cry or like, or the females like don't display anger or whatever it is, um, or don't be too much. We start to layer on other secondary emotions on top of things and can't even touch into our grief. That's yeah. very real and present. So it's really neat that embodied approach to to peeling away that layer so the river of grief can flow and you can find some lightness again. Yeah, that um, one that you mentioned around like, don't be too much, it kind of strikes a chord with me right now because to be really fully embodied, that's probably something I think possibly especially as a woman that you're going to run into is that idea of like, am I being too much as I'm mm -hmm. expressing myself in this way that's really congruent to what I'm actually feeling underneath everything. And yeah. um, that can be a kind of challenging barrier to, to hurdle over. But one that's so worth it is this idea of like, um, not, not too much if you need to express yourself with mm -hmm. words or movement or shaking <laughs> oh yeah yeah so many tools and uh and it has been especially society has been especially hard on on women in terms of uh like body shame then beauty ideals i could go off on this rant for quite quite some time but i'll just uh instead cite the work of someone i really ad admire in out of canada in the eating disorder world neva piran wrote this book called Journeys of Embodiment, and uh, that I think we've used it together sometimes. The experience of embodiment scale she developed to look at where you're at in different areas of embodiment, like joyful expression, using your voice, like uh, like connection with your sensuality, uh, things like that. And she uses through this book this model uh, the analogy of a corset, saying that especially females in this society, young, usually at a young age. It's like there's a corset applied constricting uh, them from being their full selves and there are different hooks or facets of it like a joyful movement you stop like dancing or uh, expression mm -hmm. using one's voice you stop singing and society just like wants to make us small and we tighten we constrict and we develop more and more stories of why we can't be our full selves and and the journey home to the body often involves like undoing those hooks mm -hmm. of the course at one at a time, like finding oneself through pleasure, movement, speaking, singing, uh, all, all those beautiful things, sensing, feeling. So um, that's one uh, approach that's been really helpful. 
um, both for me and and uh, the people I work with in eating disorders, and also as a as a parent of of daughters too, mm-hmm. and uh, um, helping people with their body journeys. Yeah, uh, I think one of the things I love to do more than anything in this world is give people a container where they can just be the full expression of themselves, like a a setting um, that feels safe for them to do that. And I'm thinking of like blindfolded trans dance um, because the blindfold provides a safety, like no one's gonna be watching me. Mm -hmm. And like what I see with those times that I've facilitated that, that practice and I just kind of turn around and I look at a room full of people with blindfolds on and they're just like moving however their body is telling them to move is that when they do that, they find ways to heal themselves. It is amazing what spontaneously comes out of that for people. Mm -hmm. Like I've had plenty of people report that they had the experience of a part of their ego dying just from movement. And then they might lay down and kind of have this death and then this rebirth experience where they come back as this, you know, whatever their intention is, more free, more happy, able to sense things more. Um, Mm -hmm. The weight of, of depression is gone just from freely expressing themselves yeah. through sound and movement for a relatively short period of time. I've experienced your trance dance um, and it is it is amazing. It is a whole new embodiment experience and um, so you should do another. Yep. <laughs> okay, deal. Well, we could go on forever on this topic. We might I'm need feeling to, that way too. I've... We might need to pick it up uh, <laughs> uh, on round two another day, but... Uh, I think this is probably a good place to wind down and let's go do some yoga. Hey, sounds good. Thank you. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Numinous, a mental wellness company committed to tackling the global mental health crisis by delivering best-in-class psychedelic-assisted therapies, contributing to the body of primary and clinical psychedelic research, and fostering healing through community connection and social responsibility. You can learn more about Numinous at Numinous.com. That's N-U-M-I-N-U-S.com. If you enjoyed the show today and you want to support us, here's how you do it. Rate and review the show on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe to the Numinous YouTube channel. Like the videos and share it. Share the show or clips of the show with someone that you think will enjoy it. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Consult with a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.